Hello and welcome. My name is Jürgen Schmidt. I'm director of the Fraunhofer Institute for Wind Energy and Energy Systems Technology. Today we are coming to lecture 5, Technical and Economic Feasibility of the Transformation, episode 2, which you can see here in the overview. Last time you got a lecture on episode 1, Resources, Emissions and Scenarios, given by Professor Nagy Chenovich. Today we are dealing with transformation of the energy system, the challenges and possible solutions in episode two. And at the end, as in episode three, we are coming to the interview. Before I come to the lecture itself, I would like to explain the learning outcomes you are going to understand, first of all, about what potential renewable energies can provide. Second, what uh, emission reductions can be obtained through the introduction of renewables. Third, what efficiency gain can be uh, reached with the introduction of renewable energies. And finally, we are going to look at the interaction between different sources of renewable energies in order to arrive at a sustainable and stable power supply. We are coming now to the first subchapter, which is dealing with CO2 emissions in combination with the energy demand in a global scenario. What you can see here in this diagram are three developments over the past 100 years. The green curve, which has an exponential growth, shows us the global energy demand. The red curve, which is nearly parallel going up, this is the CO2 concentration in our atmosphere and the blue one shows the increase of the population in the world. Now the target is to stop this exponential growth at least for the CO2 concentration and not to bring it only to a, a stop in the growth but to reduce it and this must be done quite fast in order to keep the temperature rise in our atmosphere below a limit of 2 degrees Celsius. As a means to reduce CO2 emissions, uh, different scenarios can be looked at. In this diagram on the left side you can see the historical growth of the energy consumption for the different energy carriers like coal, oil, gas and so on. And on the right side, the different results of simulations are shown for the year 2050. There are at least uh, two main results to be seen. First of all, there is no further increase in the growth of primary energy consumption. Second, the conversion of the different energy sources into renewable ones can be seen in the different colors, uh, brown and uh, dark brown and yellow. Those are the conventional energy sources one. We have also in yellow the contribution of nuclear energy but on top uh, we find the renewable ones and if you go to the scenario which is shown on the right hand side of this diagram this is a scenario of the WBGU which uh, is based on the assumption that we would arrive at a 100% renewable energy power supply situation. Most of the energy comes from wind, solar and biomass and a small amount of energy um, is hydropower. 
this is something special because um, also the WBGU has assumed that uh, the exploitation of hydropower, even on a global scale, uh, is quite limited, so there is no further growth compared to the situation of today. Now let's go to the next foil, which is dealing with the potential of renewable energy production. When looking to the to this diagram, we can see on the top the global power demand of electricity, which is in the order of 20,000 terawatt hours. Below we can see the potential of different renewable energy power supply sources and together with the used amount of energy coming from those sources. Beginning with wind energy, we can see that the technical potential is uh, well above the total demand of today, which means 800,000 terawatt hours compared to 20. So that's a factor of 40 between in. The same is true for solar energy. Even biomass could contribute more to 100% of the total uh, power supply and marine energy has a similar potential. As a result, we can assume that the potential of renewable energy is by far more than we need. So we have a multiple of our needs available and that is a good information. Coming to the next step, that is the efficiency. Quite often we, we hear that uh, for the transformation of our energy system be, uh, should be built on two pillars. One pillar is the introduction of renewable energy and the other pillar is the exploitation of efficiency gain in the technology. What I would like to show to you is that a very big share of the efficiency gain is coming through the information, uh, through the introduction of renewable energy. Um, to demonstrate uh, this fact, uh, we are beginning with the following diagram. In this diagram, the world's electricity production um, is shown, at least uh, the most uh, part of the electricity, which is produced by conventional power plants. The blue bar shows the amount of fuel needed to produce electricity, which is shown in the green field, and the average, or worldwide, is that only 38% of the input is being available in the form of uh, electricity. The rest is wasted energy, which is in the most cases not used. Now if we are introducing renewable energies like solar, photovoltaics, or wind, or even hydropower, if we are producing the same amount of electricity, there is no waste heat at all, and that means this part of the energy does not have to be produced otherwise. That means producing electricity uh, by means of renewable energy means a big step in efficiency gain. This can be seen also in the next slide, which shows the European electricity consumption pattern uh, over the last five years and a prediction for the next 40 years. The red curve shows the primary energy demand for the production of electricity, which is the blue curve on the bottom here. And uh, the big, uh, um, the big uh, bar, the blue bar between the red curve and the blue curve this means is the uh, conversion loss 
mainly produced through the waste heat of the conventional power stations. Now, if we are converting our electricity system in such a way that we are producing more and more electricity with wind and solar energy, we have then less and less waste heat. And this can be seen on the right side of the diagram where the blue curve and the red curve are nearly identical. That means the difference, which is the waste heat, is, has nearly come to zero. In addition to that, the emissions co co uh, connected to the production of electricity are being reduced dramatically through the introduction of renewable energies, which is the yellow curve, which goes down uh, to nearly zero. That means uh, we have finally less than 20% of the initial emissions. Now let's look to another element which is important for the total energy consumption and that is the way we are heating our buildings. Our buildings are being heated in most cases by burning of oil and gas, which is a blue bar on the left side of this diagram. If we are transforming our total energy system, there is no room for further burning oil and gas, which is limited, which has a lot of CO2 emissions, but we are producing the heat in, in an other way. Uh, first of all, we are producing heat by means of heat pumps. This is an old-fashioned way to produce heat, but in combination with the renewable energies, in combination with the renewable energies, the efficiency is now very much bigger than it was in the past. To give you an example, if you are producing electricity by means of a coal-fired power plant, you need an input of three parts in the form of coil, coal to produce one part of electricity. In a heat pump, the one part of electricity is producing three parts of heat on the other side, and that means it's the same amount as the input was in the form of coil. So there was no gain in efficiency, but if you combine now heat pumps with renewable energies without waste heat in the production side, we have an efficiency gain of a factor of four. We are going to see this effect in the next slide, but before we come to this, the upper part is uh, called CHP. CHP is combined heat and power. That means those parts of the power stations which must continue operation because they must keep the electricity system stable. Uh, those parts must be transformed in such a way that the waste heat can be used to heat our buildings. This is easily possible and by means of those two parts we are expecting the total contribution to the heating sector in our scenario. On the next slide, you can see the effect of changing our electricity production system into a renewable one. We see here three, uh, three lines, beginning with a blue one on the top. This is corresponding to the CO2 emission per kilowatt hours for an oil-fired boiler. By using natural gas, the CO2 emissions can be clearly reduced and it becomes even better when using an electric heat pump. But the more we are turning our electricity system into a renewable one, the CO2 emissions are uh, going down to nearly zero. That means an electric heat pump today 
is efficient in terms of CO2 reduction, but it will be very much more efficient through the transformation of the electricity production system. And this is also true for the next big pillar, and that is the, transform uh, the transformation of the transport sector. In the transport sector, we have the lowest efficiency of, uh, in the conversion. That means for 100% of fuel input at the shaft of our engine, of our, our cars, we get only 20%. The rest is really unused heat and that is in, in, in terms of a technology uh, a catastrophic efficiency situation. When changing to electric drive in our cars, we can increase the efficiency by some factors, by a factor of two, between two and three, which is shown on the right part of the diagram, where you have as an input renewable electricity from direct generation like wind and solar, which can nearly completely be transformed into shaft power of our car. Of course, there are some losses connected to the battery, to the charging of the battery, to the electric conversion with the electric motor, but you can clearly see the difference between um, the uh, piston engine shown on the left side and the electric system shown on the right side. We have also been looking to the consequence in the European transport sector. On the next slide, you can see the consequences of, the int of introducing electric drive into the transportation sector. Vertically, we can see the CO2, the CO2 emissions per kilometer and over the years, that means over this time in which the transformation of the whole energy system should take place. Let us begin with the blue line. The blue line uh, are the emissions per kilometer for a gasoline um, engine and the solid line and uh, the dotted line above um, takes into account also the production and scrapping, that means cradle to grave uh, observation, which clearly increases the CO2 emissions further. The diesel engine uh, improves the situation slightly and uh, there is some hope and there are some expectations that through better technology development uh, the diesel engine as well as the gasoline en engine would become more efficient. But if you compare those two engines with an electric car, which is shown with a green solid line, you can clearly see that um, there is no chance for the conventional piston engines to arrive at such low emissions. Finally, it approaches zero emissions per kilometer. Of course, also in this uh, type of uh, car, if you take into account uh, the producing of the battery and so on, uh, there are some emissions left, by, but they are by far lower than the emissions of the conventional piston engine drive driven cars. There is often a discussion whether we need electric cars because there are also biofuels and that's why I would like uh, to highlight some aspects of using biofuels and uh, this diagram which the WBGU has uh, produced in the framework of a report on the use of bio energy shows the CO2 emissions uh, for different kinds of biofuels 
compared with the emission of a conventional car, which is the horizontal dotted line for the technology of 2005. You can see that some of the bars are above and some of the bars are below this dotted line. That means uh, those kinds of biofuels which are producing bars higher than the level of the dotted line means that the emissions, the, the emissions of the biofuel driven cars are even higher than they would be fueled with conventional fuel. On the other hand, there are quite some interesting biofuels also shown and the effect is the kind of land use change. Land use change locally, that is a direct land use change and land use change somewhere else, that is an indirect land use change which um, takes into account the fact that if you are taking away areas, for instance, uh, here in Germany for biofuel production, somebody around the globe must compensate for this production in order to keep the level of food production on the same level. We have also negative emissions, for instance, palm oil uh, on degraded land. That means uh, a car which is driven by this kind of oil uh, really reduces the greenhouse gas emissions quite substantially, but we have also investigated uh, applications of biofuels for others than uh, driving an, a car and uh, this is shown on the next diagram which is here. In this diagram we have investigated many change, chains many chains uh, of biomass conversions for different applications. We have bundled those applications at the, in the upper part. This is the application for uh, electricity production. The middle part is the conversion change for the application of heat production and the lower part is the mobility sector. The green bars are showing the emissions uh, connected to the direct land use change and uh, we can see that uh, the reduction of greenhouse gases by using this kind of fuel was always positive. But taking into account the indirect land use change which is shown with the yellow bars, you can see that especially in the mobility sector, most co conversion change are leading to negative greenhouse gas reductions, or in other words, they are increasing the greenhouse gas emissions compared to a conventional car. As a consequence of those findings, we have made uh, a proposal to the German government to stop all support for biofuel uh, conversion systems. We are coming now to a very important part when using renewable energies and that is balancing the renewable energy feed-in in an electricity system. Let's begin with a power network. We are going to look to a small video showing the energy situation as an example in Germany. On the left part, left part of the picture you can see the different uh, wind speeds crossing Germany. Uh, the different wind speeds are marked with different colors which you can see on the bar on the right side. In the middle we have the different uh, levels of solar irradiance on Germany and on the right side with a bigger picture 
you can see uh, the effect of power production coming from both sources, from wind as well as from photovoltaic power plants over the time in kilowatt per square meter or in megawatt per square meter. In the lower part on the left side, in the diagram, we can see on top the red curve. The red curve shows the power consumption in Germany. You can clearly uh, see the singular days with the night valley, the daily peak, and after normally seven peaks, uh, five peaks, we see the weekends. Here, uh, this peak was a little bit irregular. Maybe it's a public holiday or something like that. Uh, down on, see, we can see in dark blue the onshore wind energy contribution, in light blue the offshore wind contribution, and in yellow with a quite regular uh, contribution the photovoltaics. This uh, is a simulation for the year 2020 where we have nearly always more consumption than the renewable energies can produce, but you can easily imagine that the difference must come from other sources which are, must be quite flexible in order to cope with this big differences in renewable energy supply. After showing to the video clips, which should give you a first impression about the dynamics of the future electricity system, we are looking into a little bit more detail about the different ways we can stabilize these uh, big fluctuations. The first and most efficient method to equalize those big fluctuations is a big overlay electricity grid. Uh, uh, on this example you can uh, see it in Europe, how we could imagine uh, the connect interconnection of wind, uh, hydropower, uh, solar, biomass plants, and simply when looking to wind energy, there is always some wind blowing over Europe somewhere, and that means energy is flowing back and forward in such a big system. This helps a lot, but this can not do everything. We must introduce further means to stabilize the electricity grid. That on the next slide, um, you can see how the combination of different power sources, the combination of wind and photovoltaics and biomass and storage can further stabilize the electricity grid. On the left side, you can see the different power sources distributed all over Germany. On, on the right side, in the diagram, you can see the different contributors. The red line is the consumption curve. The blue field is wind energy contribution. Yellow is photovoltaics. And uh, green is biomass. You can also see that we have fluctuations around the red line. If uh, there are colors above the red line, that means we have surplus energy. If the color is below, that means we have some deficit, which must be compensated either by storage plants or by importing or exporting electric energy. This helps further, but it's still not enough. As a next means, load management must be introduced. In this example, you can see how such a load management could work. Uh, on the left side, you can see a future building equipped with photovoltaics um, and some intelligent consumers like uh, dishwashers, washing machines, refrigerators, and electric heaters, and so on. 
And this all will be controlled by intelligent electricity grids in future in such a way that the consumers are consuming more energy, energy if there is more available through high winds and a lot of sun and if they are and that they are reducing electricity if there is a scarcity of those power sources. On the right side of the picture you can see a part of our laboratory where we have installed typical households to demonstrate the feasibility of this measure. Currently there are about 1,000 households being equipped with intelligent meters and intelligent consumers to demonstrate on a large scale how effective such a compensation of fluctuation can be done. This helps a lot, but it's still not enough since we have to bridge large times when uh, during winter times there is no wind and no sun and our simulations have shown that we have to bridge uh, times of nearly two weeks uh, by storage of energy and this is quite impossible uh, by using uh, today's technology. You can see a simulation of the situation on this diagram. On the bottom you can see uh, how such a renewable energy system is producing surplus energy which is shown in the negative side and deficits in the positive side and by looking to the right part of the picture you can see that um, there are longer periods of deficits uh, the whole uh, time is one year. On the top, on the red line, you can see the differences which have to be stored in a, in a theoretical, in a theoretical big uh, store and uh, in some the simulations have shown that we have to store about 8% of the electricity consumption to compensate for longer time periods. Now, how could that be done? On the next slide, we can see different technologies as a function of the storage capacity in terawatt hours and as a function of the discharge time in hours. If we are beginning with flywheels, this is a pink uh, area shown on the left down corner, we can see that we can store electric energy up to a limit of about 100 kilowatt hours and uh, the duration of the application is limited to maximum one hour. Then we have the electric batteries which we have in our cars. Of course we can make them quite big and then uh, this would allow to arrive at 10 or 100 times higher storage capacities and uh, discharge times to about 10 hours. The green field shows compressed air storage devices which uh, can store even higher uh, energies. Worldwide there are only quite a few demonstration plants available and the efficiency is quite low. A better technology is a pump storage, which is shown in blue. Pump storage devices can store electric energy up to about, let's say, 20, 30 gigawatt hours and discharge times with uh, 200 hours. This is quite good, but by far not, not enough in order to store uh, the big amount of energy needed for a time period of two weeks. With all pump storage in Germany, we can supply the nation uh, for about one hour, but we have to supply the na nation for two weeks, and that is only possible by using chemical stored, chemically stored energy. This could be either hydrogen or synthetic gas, um, the gray area is showing 
uh, the capacity of synthetic natural gas, which is a way of um, arriving at such high storage capacities we need. How can we produce synthetic natural gas? How we can we use synthetic natural gas in order to fill this storage um, demand? This is shown on the next slide. Let's begin on the left side, where we have the electric system uh, fed by wind, solar, and other renewable energies. On the right side, we have the natural gas grid. Uh, between in today, we have turbines, that means uh, gas turbines uh, to produce electricity, or combined heat and power plants on a smaller scale. We have also big gas storage capacities, which are by far higher than uh, what we need uh, to compensate for the electric fluctuations. First of all, if we have enough solar and wind, we are producing surplus energy. This surplus energy we can convert into hydrogen via electrolysis, which is shown here. The hydrogen is an ideal storage device, but there is no infrastructure today. And this is a big uh, bottleneck for the direct use of hydrogen. As uh, a means to overcome this disadvantage, hydrogen can be uh, burned with CO2. CO2 is easily available in the atmosphere. And the product, when burning hydrogen, with CO2 is simply methane. Methane is what we have in our natural gas grids. That means we are producing something which is identical with natural gas, which opens up all possibilities which we have today already with natural gas. That means we have the gas grid to distribute and to transport the energy. We have the power stations. We have the, um, the mobility application with gas-powered uh, motor cars, and we can use gas for industrial processes, and even uh, we can produce chemicals based uh, on this kind of gas. So we are opening up uh, the whole world of natural gas, and basically for the purpose of our application, that means if we have surplus electricity, we are producing gas. If we have a deficit, we are using gas to produce electricity. And this way, we can easily stabilize our electricity grid. To sum up, we have four means to stabilize our electricity grid. First of all, we have very big grids to compensate for the fluctuations. Second. We have uh, the combination of different renewable energy sources, which further, com uh, which further equalizes the system. Third, we have load management. And first, uh, fourth, we have the new way of storing gas, producing and storing gas for the very big storage capacity to compensate for one week or two weeks uh, non-availability of renewable energies. Here we have one of the drawbacks of this kind of storage. If we look to this diagram, we can see that uh, beginning with 100% of renewable power, for instance wind, by electrolyzing hydro uh, hydrogen, by producing hydrogen, we are losing 25%. By the producing methane, we are losing another 5%. If we are using gas to produce electricity again, finally, we have only one third of the initial electric energy uh, available. The rest was lost uh, most, um, mostly by producing waste heat. But this uh, can 
be improved by using the waste heat the same way as we are using waste heat in the combined heat and power production sector. Taking into account the use of waste heat, we can increase the total efficiency to a level of about 70%, which is not far away from modern pump storage uh, devices. So also using methane as a long-term storage option does not necessarily lead to big losses in the system. As a master plan, how to introduce the different steps in order to stabilize the electricity grid, we have here on this diagram the different measures. First of all, the grid shown in red must be expanded. This is typical for Germany, but for other countries as well. Then we have to introduce production management. That means a different combination of renewable energy sources for the reduction of the conventional power plants that they are called must-run units because they must run in order to keep the electricity system stable. Then we have to introduce pump storage by far more than we have. And then at the lowest level, the power to gas, which uh, is the strategy which I have been presenting before, has to be developed in order to be available after 20 years from now. Research, development, demonstration and monitoring is necessary for the whole time. That means research must begin today and demonstration as well. So far we have been talking about the potential of renewable energies and the technologies. We have not uh, been discussing the cost when introducing renewable energies and this is the last part of my lecture. I would like to begin with the electricity production cost of different kinds of renewable energies. This diagram shows on the horizontal line the electricity production in terawatt hours per year, the different power sources, and vertically this is the electricity production cost. Beginning with conventional ways of producing electricity, the gray band shows that a level of something between 3 and 5 cent per kilowatt hours is uh, generally accepted. Now, if we are beginning with photovoltaics, photovoltaics uh, is producing electricity for a far higher cost than conventional power plants. Um, the curve begins at that part um, where the total worldwide photovoltaic electricity amount is uh, existing today, and that is about a tenth of a percent today. Photovoltaics follows a learning curve. That means the more you are producing, the cheaper photovoltaic becomes, which is shown on, 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 the, on the slope, with the slope of photovoltaics. The same has been done here with wind and biomass and solar thermal power stations. The interesting thing is, if those sources would arrive at a contribution of, say, something between 10 and 20 percent, which is shown with the vertical red lines, they can all compete with conventional energy sources. That means renewable energies become, are becoming cheaper and we simply have to further develop them until they are equally expensive in the production cost or afterwards even cheaper. This is what I would like, like to show to you. Here we have an independent analysis of the electricity production cost of wind on the left side with a big spread between very well located and sited wind turbines producing electricity for three and a half cent 
and average uh, locations where wind can be wind electricity can be produced for nine cents. If we are comparing this with coal-fired power plants, and if we take into account emission certificates for 20 euros per ton, we can see that good sited wind energy can produce electricity by far cheaper than a conventional coal-fired power plant. We have investigated the additional cost of today for, re for the introduction, for the massive introduction of renewable energies for Germany in the electricity sector, which shows that an annual additional cost of about 15 billion is necessary for the next 15 years. But then we have a crossover afterwards. This kind of electricity becomes cheaper than conventional one. If you sum up all these parts year by year, then you can see that an investment of about 200 billion is necessary. But if you make a bilancy by mid of our century, we have a gain of about 700 billion of euros. So it's very well worthwhile to introduce renewable energy systems also in terms of economics. I come now to the conclusions. I hope that I could show to you that the transformation of our total energy system is really possible. We have the potential, we have the technology, there are no inventions necessary to in arrive uh, at the new situation and even it's attractive in terms of economics. That's one of the most important findings through our investigations we have done in our report. Now, dear students, I have been talking all the time, and it's really time that you are doing now something. Let's come to the homework, to the exercises for your study. And uh, I am proposing that um, you are trying to answer those questions, namely, could a 100% renewable power system exclusively be based on photovoltaic be realized? And does make it sense? That means you should discuss the characteristics of the required storage and the power versus capacity. And you will have find some surprises. Second, you should compare the pros and the cons of renewable energy use and which actions have to be taken to compensate for the negative aspects. You should also gather information and investigate the current development status of different balancing options. And finally, please compare the different options for CO2 neutral mobilities. Mobility is the most difficult part of the energy transformation and you should invest enough time in order to come up with a detailed meaning on that. So with those, I would like to thank you for your attention and I wish you much fun to answer those questions put down in the exercises. Thank you. <laughs>